white text over video of past events. Logo, Chicago Cultural Accessibility Consortium. Professional Development Series presents Inclusive Programming for Children with Disabilities. At the front of a room, seated at a table are five people. To the left, a screen with projected captions and slides. Seated at the table, at the far right, a woman addresses the audience. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for today's workshop. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Peterson. I'm going to be the moderator for our panel discussion today. Um, we're going to be talking about inclusive programming for children with disabilities, for our title slide here. Uh, I want to point out that uh, we've kept this topic a little bit broad, and um, I'm going to be asking in a second kind of who we have here in our audience today. Um, but for some of us, programming may mean drop-in programs for kids who just come to your site um, just kind of on, on any particular day. Or it could be um, families or children who are coming for a performance. Or it could be uh, kids who are signing up for a program and coming for a facilitated activity. Uh, or it could be completely outside of any of those three. So we are actually kind of thinking about any and all of that. Um, so depending on what your background is and, and kind of what you're thinking about today, we'll try to cover a lot of different um, perspectives. Um, so again, my name is Jacqueline. I am part of the CCAC, the Chicago Cultural Accessibility Consortium. Um, I've been on the steering committee for the last couple of years. Um, I currently work at Shedd Aquarium. I've been there for about six months, and before that, I was at Lincoln Park Zoo. So if I've been any of you, you may know me from my background there, um, where I was actually um, the manager <laughs> of public programs, so programs for youth, families, and adults over at the zoo. Um, my position at Shedd is a little bit different. I'm um, focusing on Great Lakes conservation and programming. So it's still kind of relevant to this, but really my, my um, excitement for this topic was sparked uh, with what I was doing at the zoo previously. So it's kind of set that up so you know who was talking to you here today. Um, I would like to give a couple points uh, before we get started um, about CCAC specifically. Uh, we're wrapping up our second year of programming, and within the last two years, we've done a total of 14 programs and had over 600 participants at those programs. Granted, a lot of those are repeat attendees, um, but that's really impressive, and I see a lot of familiar faces here, so it's awesome to have you guys here, and it's been great to get to know a lot of you, and thanks for those of you who are completely new to CCAC. Um, and I'm going to be sharing some announcements at the end of the season to let you know kind of what's or at the end of the workshop, to let you know kind of what's coming up in, in the next season or two. Um, but one of our main philosophies with the CCAC is that this is a safe space in this room. And this is really important because I am not perfect, our panelists are close to perfect, but <laughs> our panelists are close to And, you know, I'm kind of guessing a lot of you guys aren't perfect either. So if we're using the wrong verbiage, if we are saying something that may seem sensitive to others. Um, this is a safe space where we've come together and want to learn together to make things better. Uh, so if you do have any advice for folks about your language, feel free to let them know on the side, let any of us know on the side, um, but know that we're not here to judge each other, we're here to help each other and we're going to get better or we're going to make our programs more inclusive to the kids coming to our sites. So keep that in mind, that's a cool thing about CCAC that um, we want everyone to feel comfortable here. Um, so, as I mentioned, the panelists up here have a lot of experience and expertise, but we know that there's also a lot of expertise in our audience today. Uh, so we are going to be giving an intro and then we're going to be doing a panel discussion, but throughout that time, uh, we want to hear from you. If you have tips or suggestions or if you have questions, this is going to be pretty interactive throughout the whole presentation. Um, just to jump to, I have a couple slides here. Um, my mind, especially as a programmer at the zoo, and even with what I'm doing now currently, it shed is very linear in a lot of ways. Um, and, you know, it's kind of A to Z. Like, how are we going through each step as we're putting programs together and delivering those to our audience? Uh, so we're going to start out with our panel questions in a few, actually in probably about 20, 25 minutes when we get to the actual panel part. We're going to be running through things from A to Z, so kind of a big overview of why, so the overall philosophy and strategy. And then running through the steps of determining your offering, figuring out registration, marketing, program design, facilitation, staff training, and kind of our last impact or how we're connecting this to what our kids are getting outside of our programs. Um, so we're going to be kind of, kind of that A to Z linear path. Um, might be just an easy way of framing all of this for us. Um, so I'm going to ask you guys some questions so we can get to know who you are because that's going to help all of us 
tailor what we're saying and talking about today to who you are and what you're bringing to the group. Um, so I'm just going to do some quick polling, um, and I'm just going to ask you guys to raise your hand as we kind of run through these questions so that we can get to know who is here. Uh, so raise your hand if you are from a zoo or aquarium. <laughs> what about a museum? A theater? What else am I missing? Arboretum. Arboretum or a botanic garden? Forest preserve. Forest preserve. What about any students here? And did, is there anybody that I missed? Any other type of institution? Um, raise your hand if you've been to a CCA workshop before. Raise your hand if you've never been to one before. This is your first one. Awesome. That's like a habit to happen. That's really cool. Nice to see so many new faces. Um, raise your hand if you have done quite a lot with inclusion and accessibility. You don't have to consider yourself an expert, but you've done quite a bit. Maybe your job really revolves around a lot of stuff like that. Okay, what if um, you have some experience with this, but you still feel like you have quite a bit to learn kind of in the middle of somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> and then who here is a like you just heard about this like a few minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, how many of you work in an education department? How many within some kind of like a community outreach? What about performances? What about like customer service? I don't know, I think we're raising hand for everything. It's my small organization. <laughs> A lot, but what else? Where are you guys coming from? What other kind of departments? Publication. Publication. Okay, cool. Others. Anyone else who, um, in like marketing or design or things like that? I know we have a lot of folks who do that at past workshops. Okay, awesome. So that gives us quite an idea that we have a broad variety of folks here with us today. And so that's awesome. Thank you for sharing a little bit about yourselves. Um, and again, feel free to jump in. We do have a mic runner. Um, Christina has a microphone. So at any point today, if you have a question, please flag Christina over so you can use the microphone. We're all going to be uh, talking to the mics. We have assistive listening devices that some folks may be using, so we're going to be sure to amplify what we're saying. Um, okay, so from there, I'm going to just briefly introduce our four panelists. I'm actually just going to be handing it over to them to introduce themselves and tell you what got them to be um, on this panel. Um, and basically what they're going to be doing when they're introducing themselves is telling you a little bit about their background and what their voice is when they're approaching our panel discussion today. Because we have quite a, few, uh, quite a variety of different points of view up here. Um, so we have Katie Yo from the Chicago Children's Theater, Josh Rubinski, who's a parent of a child who attends programs at Jesus Playhouse in Cable. And I'm sure you guys will talk a bit about Changes Playhouse and these different types of organizations. Um, Sylvia Cohen is the AVP of Play and Learning Initiatives at Chicago Children's Museum. That's such a fun title. You guys both have fun titles, actually. Because Mark Freeland is the Play Program Supervisor at Brookfield Zoo. Um, so these are our folks, and I'm actually from there going to hand it over to them to introduce themselves. They're each going to give about a five minute chat about kind of who they are, what their background is. And then from there, we're going to run through a bunch of our, our panel questions and get the conversation going. All right. So Katie's going to be first. Hi, I'm Katie. Um, so I have primarily a theater background as a performer first. Um, and in 2010, I started, along with my partner, Moina, a program of a team drama troupe for Gigi's Playhouse Chicago. Have you been familiar with Gigi's at all? Couple of us, couple of Gigi's uh, is a community center for individuals and their families um, so they run a wide range of programs, literacy tutoring, um, math tutoring, plays uh, for all different ages. Um, so we started a team drama troupe there, which was the first drama troupe for any Jesus Playhouse. There are 19 locations, something like that, around the country. Um, and it just exploded. We started with six kids, and now, this is four years later, we have 20. Um, so it really just grew and grew. So we, since we started the program from Gigi's to Chicago Children's Theater, um, and it's now our own um, self-sustaining program called ABLE, Artists Breaking Limits and Expectations. Um, so our first official project is ABLE was a short film that we produced last fall that with the help of a ton of organizations around the city, so we might work for somebody who helped us out, and thank you. Um, and now we're in more 
rehearsals for uh, play next week for Grey House and Wonderland for Adventures in Wonderland um, next Friday, May 22nd at the page. Um, so we do a lot of classes and this is specific programming um, for individuals who are almost the kids with teenagers with down syndrome around ages 13 to 20 right now. Um, and you can see them all in our film trailer. <laughs>
raise your hand. <laughs> and including that person in the back who's also an expert on programming at Chicago Children's Museum, Lynn. Um, but I, I've prepared a few slides, so I'm going to do this. Yeah, the advanced one. Oh. So, um, after the museum, we do a lot of different kinds of programs, and I'm just going to talk about our drop-in programs because um, there's enough just to say about those programs. Um, mainly, what we're trying to do at all times is create an invitation for everyone. That's our reason for being here today, and our reason for doing everything we can in terms of training, adapting programs is to include as many kids as possible. That bottom slide, you see a child who's on our ice skating rink um, in his wheelchair. And he's invited to do that, of course. Um, we're never working by ourselves. Um, Mark and I just had a conversation about this. Um, we're very dependent on parents to help us figure out kind of what to do for children. Um, you know, I was a special ed teacher for years and years. It's very different. You know your kids really well. Um, when kids come into the museum, we're just meeting them for the first time. We don't know them at all. The people who are coming with them, whether they're, care whether they're parents, grandparents, teachers, whatever kind of caregiver they are, they know those kids. And they can really help us make that connection. And they're part of the connection, and they're the connection that goes home. So it's really important. Um, we use a you know, basic universal design for learning, looking different, uh, for different ways to present things, um, giving visitors a variety of ways to express themselves. And then really varying the ways that visitors are engaged with ways that we support them. Um, and we're always looking at, okay, what's the challenge here? How do we make sure it's at the right level? We talk about the challenge being just right, that zone of talking with development, however you want to think about it. But how do you have a challenge that's right for everybody? Um, whether, you know, they need something more challenging or they need something less challenging. And challenge just means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, including risk. So here's one of our programs that we did last summer every day uh, called Danger 101, and it was a human wrecking ball. You went up on that platform, you grabbed a hold of that rope, and you swung. Okay? So that was a program where we spent a lot of time thinking about all of the characteristics of our visitors and all the different ways that they were going to be able to interact and have a successful experience with this. Okay? That's a, that's a pretty, uh, there's a lot of risk there. And also a lot of issues related to physical cognitive skills in order to do that in terms of you know, motor planning, etc. Another one, tangrams, can be very difficult, or it can be a puzzle, or you can make your own puzzle, put your own picture together. It doesn't have to be closed-ended, it can be very open. Uh, Art of Go-Go, you, you squeeze a little paint into a box, and then you give that box a shake. We had some uh, training from Levitech, and they basically said, hey, why don't you take the box shut? What a good idea. It made it so much easier. <laughs> little marbles that are in that box from flying out with all that paint. It's just not too much fun. Okay, and we do a lot of training. And I'm going to save that discussion until we circle back to it with everybody else. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Mark Friedland. I'm a play program supervisor at the Hamill Family Play Zoo. I've been at the zoo for about 15 years and started at the Hamill Family Play Zoo um, in 2001 when it opened and was a frontline staff member there. And uh, we were really encouraged at that point and, and excited because we had an access coordinator and that position um, was unfortunately grant funded and eliminated. So staff members that supported that position and um, were connected with that individual that was there um, ended up taking on some of those roles. And that's how I became somebody who can be on this panel. I uh, was one of those many staff members at the zoo that um, I supervised uh, volunteers at the play zoo and had a group of volunteers from local high schools that worked this program out with the, the um, LADSI group, it's the LaGrange Area Department of Special Education. And we were looking at maybe 
having that program end. And it was called our Good Works program. And several of us said, no, it's too important a program, and it's too amazing to see these students here um, learning job skills and supporting us as volunteers at the zoo. So we continued on with that program and um, have gained so much from that. Um, it's been neat to see each year, each group of students come through and be a part of that program, but then all that I've learned from them and being uh, connected here to CCAC and then getting training from our partnerships. Uh, so the LaGrange Area Department of Special Education came in and did trainings for us as staff members. And we learned um, a, a lot of ways to welcome people and to engage parents and not look at parents as an, an enemy or somebody who's going to attack you if you do something wrong. Um, ask them and invite them to, to be a partner in that. Because the gift we have at a cultural institution and not being a school is parents are there with their children. And the benefit from having that group of volunteers in that Good Works program, they saw that we had volunteers there that were learning job skills. And our audience at the Hamill Family Play Zoo is young children and families. And if you would have a child and parent come and it's Many times you'll have a, a child with a disability that's there, and a parent then sees that there's a volunteer with a disability there. Um, you can have that um, open communication and support for them. Um, and that has grown. The zoo um, continues to employ and grow our partnership <coughs> with uh, other organizations. We have a partnership with the National Inclusion Project, and they're coming in to do uh, training with our uh, camp staff. And um, it's the second year that they've been coming um, to train our camp staff. We've grown from these partnerships and now actually can provide um, a program called Camp for All. And a program where we encourage and invite um, campers and um, families that have children with disabilities to come to our camp. And there are some scholarships that are available as well for those individuals that would need that support as well. Um, the addition that has come from that as well, we have um, a position where we'll have uh, inclusion specialists for our summer camp program. So developing out of these trainings and partnerships we've been able to continue to grow and put these uh, supports in place for um, children and families that come to our programs. In paid programs for camp, but also just our general guest population coming to the place within the zoo in general. So adding you know, a, a better and bigger accessibility page and making sure that that advanced information is out there for guests, and then also inviting in Anytime somebody is coming for a program, saying um, in a letter or confirmation that goes out by email, if you have any requests or uh, needs um, beyond our program or what you see described here, please contact us and let us know. So um, that's a, a lot of what we've done, and um, I'll turn it back over to the group and we can talk about more stuff in our. Um, uh, panel discussion afterwards. Well, thank you so much for providing this introduction, and I just want to thank you all for joining us today and sharing your voice and your background. Because as you guys as you guys can see, we have a lot of different points of view. And um, Lucas, if you don't mind, I have or actually I have this slide. Yeah, so I'm going to jump back to this slide so that we can kind of keep this in mind of how we're starting that conversation today. And again, with each of these points. Um, different folks will have more or less to share about these, these steps that we're all thinking about when we're putting programs together. So thank you again for coming and bringing in the different perspectives. This is going to be great. Um, so I kind of wanted to start off again with this big picture point of view of why. And I think some of this already came out when you guys were giving your introductions and it even totally applies to the type of organization that you're working with and where you're coming from. 
because you already sort of gave some tidbits about figuring out the arts and the children's museum and, and giving opportunities for exploring and then you know being at Hamilton family with the zoo where again it's a lot of exploration and, and connecting across um, between people and the animals of course. Um, but I, I kind of want to hear from you guys your overall philosophy or strategy with inclusive programming and some of it's going to be personal, but then also if you want to think about it for, for yourself, but then also what you think other folks should keep in mind. Like, what, what should we all be thinking about? Why should we be doing inclusive programming? Why is this important? Um, can I start with you, Katie? Yeah, sure. Cool. Um, and not everyone has to answer every question, but whoever wants to jump in again. So, um, you know, I, when we branched and, and made our own program, we called it ABLE for a really specific reason, because I think there's a lot of focus on what kids can do, and I can confirm looking up you guys in the face and saying, we're going to do a Shakespeare play with all of your kids, and they, yeah. <laughs> but I think that everybody is able, right? There is, everybody has the capacity to communicate, to connect with somebody to to do these things, you know, it's just a matter of us having to figure out how to, how to match them. Um, so I, you know, that's, that's where that came from for me, is that I really do believe that we have to try to help these individuals who have a voice somewhere in there that maybe just doesn't get listened to, you know, or nobody's asking them for it, um, and helping them to try to express themselves or figure out what that voice is. And I can see a lot through the arts, especially I think when the urban academy is talking in general, you to, when you're working with a cultural institution like this, you're helping people build skills that are, yes, we're doing doing a play and that's great. I'm not trying to get these kids on Broadway, but I do think I can help them learn teamwork and I do think I can help them learn communication and I think that I can help them learn some focus skills and um, some ways to empathize with other people and how to work around that. So, you know, trying to strip it down to what are the, the life skills that you can bring and impart that's going to help make your day-to-day -day life a little better. I just want to add on to some of what you said, Katie, because um, yeah, uh, it, from the perspective of inclusion, so definitely when those six of us brought our kids that uh, Katie and Mal the first time they were doing it, they're like, they're just in a little em empty room at GGs, and they're like, we're going to do Shakespeare, and the kids are going to decide which play to do. And so that was, how long ago was that? That was So Sam was 12 or 13. Yeah. And, um, and we didn't think that we, we thought that they were really sweet kids. Yes. These two young women were really, really nice. <laughs> yeah. They were going to make you sit on kids for an hour and a half. Yeah. 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 But we were like, they do not know what they're getting themselves into. We did not think they knew what they were doing. And uh, I'm telling you that, Katie's heard me say it before, because we learned so much about our kids by the drama group, by what they did in the drama group. And it's all kids with Down syndrome, now there's 20. So some people look at that and go, oh, that's not inclusive. The kids with Down syndrome are separate. And I just want to share my perspective on that, okay? Um, Sammy's been in multiple Shakespeare plays now. Not adapted wording, but wording is Shakespeare's wording. They don't do every line. Um, they get up and perform, and he has performed those parts. And so when we come here to see a Shakespeare play, or when it's on TV, or when he's talking to his peers, who has more familiar with Shakespeare anybody? He knows the, the emotions that the characters experience in the plot. He knows the plot points. He's included in that conversation. If he was at our neighborhood high school in the in, in, included um, in the play, he would have a little piece of that experience, but he wouldn't know the play. Um, because they get the kids inside of it. And Katie just said she's not trying to get the kids on Broadway, but I just want to point out, you are getting them into the, the, the movies in the park. That's pretty darn close. My other kids are, are into drama, and they have not yet had any <laughs> so, um, so, so I think just, just to, the take home for me is we learn about our kids from what they do with cultural experiences. And that um, programs that really, um, the two sides of inclusion, there's the, we were talking about before, universal design inclusion um, and ways that everyone can do the same thing together. And then there's the specialized inclusion. I do think of it as inclusive, where the kids uh, work with somebody who's figured out how to access things that maybe their parents don't even know about them. And then they become included that way, so that's all I can say. I, I think I'd like to add that um, when we were designing or planning programs, 
that we're looking for multiple levels of success. That there isn't one outcome that's successful and you have to have it a certain way. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that from a family perspective as well, at the Play Zoo, that families can work together and have a, a product together as a family from an art experience or from a day at the zoo. What is, what is their goal as a family? And so when you can say, maybe their goal is just to have an experience that's not at home or in a classroom and that they feel welcome. So that might mean having a quiet walk in the backyard at the play zoo or around the zoo grounds and not even seeing an animal and that's a successful day for them. And they might build to the experience that um, they, they can go into a loud exhibit like the play zoo and play with blocks and animals or pet an animal and be excited by that one experience with the guinea pig. I, I will say, I think down to the room, especially, and I know I'll just, you know, anything you're looking at, it exists on a spectrum, right? And so you have to think of, there's an, you know, there's an individual in there. So I'm in a room with 20 kids with Down syndrome, but they are all completely different in terms of verbal ability, in terms of, you know, comfortability with being touched, with not being touched. Um, you know, they've got different siblings of different ages, those, you know, down to the not a cookie cutter one size fits all thing. You know, there's a there's a wide range to that, which is something I don't think I ever really appreciated until I started working with kids. Because I worked with adults with Down syndrome, and I think when you were working with like a group home or something, you know, people who are able to live on their own, you're seeing sort of the higher functioning side of it, you're not necessarily seeing how there are there's so many different levels to what you might be working with. So again, like some of our kids, I'm trying to get them to say one word out loud, and that's a huge deal. And some of them go ahead and memorize that line, do it without me, go ahead and do it. Like it's there's all different levels and challenges and you have to kind of I think if my biggest thing that I can ever say to anybody is you can't look at someone with a disability like they have a disability. They're still is a person. You know, and I think that that's the biggest thing is how can you make it as, as interesting for all these different types of people as possible. And remembering that every person is different. You know, just you sitting whoever you're next to, you're going to be different. So that's my personal goals. So I think we're already kind of heading into my next area of figuring out like what do you offer for folks. And I don't know about other people who either manage, coordinate, or staff the programs at your sites, but I know that for me, that is kind of sticking points to figuring out what to do, and that can be kind of paralyzing. Um, and Josh, I think you mentioned the terms universal design versus like special inclusion. And, um, and I've heard a lot of great examples from folks on the panel and from other organizations in Chicago. Um, some programs that are inclusive and just say, we design this program for anybody to come. And there are some programs that are targeting different audiences, whatever that may be. Um, and so I am looking for advice from the panel for, it, and this is going to depend on your organization completely, um, but, but if you have advice generally about how do you figure out what direction to go, and especially for anybody who's just kind of starting in with this. So if you're sort of a beginner, what's well, a good place to start figuring out just what to offer and getting to know your audience Uh, school groups versus families, I mean, there's just so much diversity. 
among our audience, and any particular program um, is maybe not going to work with everybody, but we try to make it as big in everybody as we're a bigger group as we possibly can. It's tricky otherwise. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, if you start to just think about everything having to be for everybody, then you start to look at yourself in different ways. So, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a price. I like to say, you have offering a lot of menu and letting people self select it. Right. Just use your own decisions. You're not making your decisions for them. I would just like to share that um, I, I'm a big fan, my wife and I and, and, and Sammy, we're big fans of programs that serve people with similar special needs, such as the Able Drama Group that's called Teams with Down Syndrome. Sammy's High School is, is a specialized school in Chicago Public Schools, uh, Jackie Bond High School at, at JAM in the system, if anybody wants to go see how it's done really well. Um, and Jackie Bond serves kids with developmental cognitive delays within a certain range. Um, and Independence Park, the Santa's is after school program has been doing since he was a little kid, and they have a program for people with special needs. So those are all specialized programs, and it seems like listening to what you guys do, that, that the interface between the specialized programs and the open to the public, everybody's in programs is really important. Every Wednesday, Sandy has community-based instruction with Jackie Bond. They go out and they go places, they go to the forest preserve, they go to a soup kitchen, they go do this, they go do that. The people at Independence Park really know the kids, like Katie was talking about, you, you know them over time. And um, you don't have that at a museum, but if you work with the people who do know them over time, you might get a new view of what those kids can do, what it looks like when they are interfacing with the children's museum or with the zoo. And also then, when Sammy comes back, he already knows the children's museum because they came with school. And so then he has an in. So I just would like to really plug the programs that are specialized into it really well are just a great resource for educators. I think some of the best advice I ever got as a teacher was um, that they will tell you if it's not working, right? So you have to you have to listen, you know, and listen to it. So try something, throw something out there. You know, that's where the theater record comes in. You're all compromising everything we're doing. You know, try something, you throw it out there. If it's a train wreck, you'll know, and they'll tell you. And especially, I mean. Kids, they've got no filter. They'll tell me right like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Great, I gotta figure something else out, you know. So try it and play with it, and then you use you know, use the audience, use the feedback because they think that there's that's how you that's where you go. We're on our eighth play right now, stage play, and I finally feel like I have a, a system, you know, because it takes time to figure out exactly how it's gonna work. So I was just my advice to you. Try, try it, and if that one didn't work, try it the other approach and see what happens. I would just recommend asking. Ask yeah. those parents, ask those participants, mm -hmm. and once you make friends and, and people in, in the different groups, um, we were really fortunate to come down, and Lynn actually uh, showed us uh, some stuff at Chicago Children's Museum, and then all of our other partners um, coming up with ideas for programs and, and ways to support people with um, disabilities. So getting those friends and getting support from them and then asking parents and participants what they'd like to see next. And I'll jump in and kind of share a plug for CCC because what you're saying is that you got a little bit, you, you learn from uh, the children's <coughs> what this group is all about. So we are going to have some time for networking and getting to meet each other at the very end of today's workshop. So keep that in mind that we all want to be a resource for each other. And in some ways, maybe our organizations are competing in, you know, towards funding or audience, things like that. But this is an area that we're not in competition. We want each other to all be better at things. So um, that's a good resource. And then keep that in mind as we're figuring out what kind of programs we can and should be doing. Um, I just want to remind you guys that Christina has a microphone, and so if you guys have something you can or ask questions as we run through this, we'll have time for like a formal Q&A, but as we're going in a step-by-step, -step, you guys may have questions or things to add, so catch Christina's eye if you have anything. Um, all right, cool. So, okay, so say you've decided what kinds of things you're going to offer, and you're trying to figure out um, how to get the word out about those things. So there's these are kind of tied in registration and marketing. And my thought about registration is not just like what you know online 
want to use, but what are the questions you should be asking? Um, what is the language you should be using? How do you, how do you make yourself seem inclusive to parents who sometimes, I don't know, sometimes you see people use language where you're like, I know what, I know what they're trying to ask here, and I don't really appreciate what they're asking here, things like that. So in registration, it's sort of the communication, starting to chat with parents, and then also marketing is also chatting with parents, or since they're the decision makers most of the time for your audience. Um, so it's not, I don't know if it's a specific question, but just in terms of either of these things and advice that you guys have for our folks. How does it to find out a favorite? Like what's something that this kid loves? So I can turn a conversation to that if I need to. You know, if there's if there's if there's a meltdown happening or there's, you know, or it's just we're just not engaged or involved, but I know you love Hannah Montana, I can shape the conversation towards that or towards something that's, you know, that's there. So trying to find, go in knowing a passion already off the top of your head is, is helpful. Or like if you're at a zoo, I imagine somebody's coming with like a, I want to see a favorite, chimpanzee. Favorite animals. Yeah, yeah like you want to know, know the favorite and then you can kind of gear stuff towards that and then everything can tie back into it. I had a kid, not in our program, but another program that I worked with and he was obsessed with Tom Hanks. I loved him. <laughs> and everything we wanted him to do, we just had to do, you know, Ryan, Tom Hanks does this one. You know, Ryan, Ryan, this is Tom Hanks' favorite song. Um, and that would get him from having his face to the corner to actually coming back into the room. You know, so that's always a good question. What's your favorite thing? So really you're saying kind of individualizing the child before they even get to that program. Absolutely. Like, Getting yeah. information about them as a person and that's yeah. comforting for the parent but also sets you up so that you have some tools in your tool belt before you meet that child. Yeah. And a dislike is important in there too. Ben is a of ceiling fans. Can't have ceiling fan on in the room. Important to know before he shows up. You <laughs> think, you know, a big favorite like a big favorite dislike is nice to have, you know, again, because they're people. So just to make it as important as possible. Yeah. So I, I think asking a parent um, what's the best way I can support your child in this experience and sometimes there are parents that are afraid that it will be a limiting factor and so they will hold back and not want to give you a diagnosis or they want you their child to be an individual when they come in and that's valued and understandable and so you meet them where they're at and you say okay well I noticed this so say what you see. I noticed that your child was upset or frustrated by something. How can I support them through this? Help me work through a strategy that we can agree on. And when we do that, parents are excited to, to tell us, oh, you want to help us. And, and you're not looking at, at us as an enemy or going to tell us no, that our child can't be here. And we'll work with them. So, reassuring as well, reassuring parents. Um, a couple of you have brought up specific partnerships with other organizations, <laughs> including Gigi Johnson and Google and all that. Yeah, nice. Ooh, oh, but now I got it. I'm sorry, I got it. Did she go ahead and jump to it? Was it all that? Um, um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Piggy back me, Mark. I work for Chicago Zoological with the outreach programs. Um, uh, some of the programs that we partner with the uh, Chicago Public Schools and Libraries. Um, and I think it's important um, as we go out, as me and um, my coworkers go out to facilitate these programs, uh, that because they're inclusive, we don't know who we're getting with these children. So we, may, we may know, like, if I'm doing a staff, I'm working with three to 12 year olds, and the newest one, science, uh, conservation science explorer, so to be six, seven, eight years. I don't know what type of children I'm getting in there. So what we're prepared to do is make sure when we're doing the program, when we have children that have a disability and children who don't have a disability, we're able to be flexible. When we notice it, it's just being, you know, it is reaching out, speaking with the parents. Um, one child um, had autism, came to the class. The mother was a little hesitant. Is this okay? Of course it's okay. I, there's nothing saying, no, this child can't come. What do I need to do? What, what, is, what is this child's needs? 
It was a few little things. We were able to work through it, work into the program, and very happy and achieved the earlier subject several times, and we did benefit from it. So I think it's really important just to, uh, uh, when you have things like at work here, we have things on site, but we also go out into the community too, and just being uh, flexible. That's great. Thanks for bringing up that point because you're right. You don't always have that opportunity to have that conversation beforehand. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, just on, on this question, of once parents know that there's a program that works for their child, syndrome or autism or whatever it might be, um, that's valuable knowledge because we are caretakers are always looking for stuff to do. Like we are big time consumers of stuff to do. And um, so once we know that at the, at the zoo or at the forest preserve. There's somebody there who really knows how to work with our kids. We will be there, and so like whatever outreach you guys can do to the places where we are, like we, we we gather together, we support each other, we share ideas about what our kids are going to do. We go in groups, you know what I mean. We're, so um, any way to make it known, try out uh, developing just kind of like what you've done with Shakespeare Theater for us. We come to the Shakespeare Theater to Kate to develop that relationship with you guys for what you do here. Um, so uh, I guess it's a networking. Thing. Really, you know, there's these close knit groups of people who are desperate for stuff for our kids to do, and then there's all of these people who want to do good stuff for kids. So, let's um, figure that out. I will say, like, our our program in Rolling Triple in two years, and I did not a single. There was no advertising. There was no, like nothing. It was literally okay. just like, yeah. Okay. It was just them saying, "Hey, are you going to go your drama? It's like come to drama, come to drama." But, like that is. It, I had to do nothing. So once you once you find your niche, it's, the, the need is there, the want is there. The power of word of mouth. Yeah, yes. um, so on that note, though, a couple of you have mentioned partnerships between like, a cultural institution and a trusted community organization of some sort. Um, and so I'd like to hear a little bit more about your thoughts. Say you, one of our programmers here is interested in partnering with an organization, how might they want to approach that? So in the sense that maybe they want to develop a new program that is geared towards kids with Down syndrome. Um, I don't know, how, who should they get in touch with? How should they approach that? Uh, whether it's Down syndrome or something else. It, partnerships are just such a great opportunity because there's already a community of folks out there and they probably trust their community organization maybe in ways that are, you know, deeper than they trust that cultural institution because they're more involved in the community of that, that organization. So I just want to hear your thoughts on how to approach that and the power of, of partnerships. Anyway. Um, the zoo has worked with a lot of nonprofit organizations. So a local organization near us is uh, Community Support Services, or CSS. And um, they've partnered with us to help develop um, additional volunteer programs for adults um, uh, with disabilities. So um, finding uh, those local organizations that are nearby that might have that reach into a community. Um, a lot of times uh, recreation associations or special education uh, departments, local schools, all of those teachers that are out there uh, working with uh, children with special needs are the ones that will kind of even bet, like, uh, trust them, they're a good organization, um, this organization is still working on some things, and, and they'll help guide you. And so if you develop those partnerships um, through the schools and those associations, I think you, you can't really go wrong. We've had a wonderful partnership with Francis Parker School that goes back a lot of years, 20, 30, I don't even know, a lot of years. Um, and what happens is that a, a, a teacher or two teachers bring a group of middle school kids who then uh, partner, um, become play partners, play friends for a group of children with disabilities. Um, and they play together in the museum and it just really enriches the experience for both groups. For both groups, it's just really an awesome program. It's been going on for a lot of years, and it's, it's you know, I think it's just so rewarding for the as for the Parker kids as much as for the you know, kids from the special classrooms. I think, I mean, as you said, like any organization, schools or I mean, or you huge aspire is huge. Aspire would be great um, to reach out to you know 
there's also a nice opportunity there for your staff, you know, because you can, I know we're going to talk about training a little bit later, but, you know, if you can get it, somebody who works in this field full time can come and talk to your people a little bit about, you know, this is what works, this is what the best practices, all of that stuff, and give you a little bit more of a heads up. Um, that's where I think GG was super helpful for us as a, as a place to grow because we had access to these workshops about, you know, how to help teach someone that's on some of us, and, you know, we needed visual, more visual aids, we needed stuff that we necessarily weren't thinking about off the top of our heads. So um, I don't really think there are more relationships out there. And there's there's a ton of there's a ton of them. There's a lot of community organizations. Jesus and the those are the two biggest ones that I can think of. Great Lakes, ADA, and then also the lead conference. Huge help for us at the zoo as well. So and learned about those new CCAC. And we'll talk a bit about the lead conference later as well, so thanks for referencing that. Um, at the beginning, when we were asking about what departments a lot of you work in, a lot of you were raising your hand for like, the <coughs> department or most of them. Um, and so a point that you're making is that it's hard to be an expert in everything. It's actually impossible to be an expert in everything. And so it makes sense to work with expert organizations that really know an audience really well and can provide training or consulting or resources, um, and that's just a really great idea. Um, and especially for those of us with just limited resources, instead of trying to have a staff person who knows everything and all these specialties, we know other partners, so that's a great idea. Um, and we will talk about, yes, staff training again in a, in a bit. Um, I want to ask a question, I guess I'll gear this towards Sylvia. Um, just a, on to kind of our next focus area, so program design supplies and spaces, because I also have toured the Chicago Children's Museum, as some of the folks here have, and then pointed out a lot of great design elements and a lot of um, adapted equipment for different programs. Um, so I just want to hear any advice that you have for, I guess, either exhibits or more programs uh, about all of that stuff. <laughs> Um, so speaking of organizations that we have at Institute of Chicago, oh, yeah. it's extraordinary, yeah. extraordinary um, in helping us design environments that um, work for all audiences, for all, for all visitors, um, and that's been terrific. In terms of uh, our own programming, I mean, we think pretty carefully about table heights and access and how people can get to us and how they can get on the ice or off the, on the human wrecking ball or yeah, Kim, I know down and Josh down in the art studio also have these similar experiences of thinking about, okay, oh, what about someone in a wheelchair or something? Somebody who has limited use of one arm, do you, do you want to address it? That would be much better. Okay. Hi, I'm Kim, I'm a work with Sylvia at Children's Museum. And yes, in our, especially in our, our programming spaces, we really try to make sure, again, that, um, we are accessible as possible. Part of that is, um, our programs design, um, there's multiple entry points. And I think part of it is because, you know, we're designing programming that might work for a two-year-old and a 12-year-old. And within that, there's just um, a range of ability, a range of interest, a range of um, prior experience and knowledge. So it could be simply as whenever we're putting out scissors, we're putting out scissors that might be like regular children's scissors. Or, um, then, you know, do we have lefty scissors, do we have scissors that um, people who have limited dexterity in their hands can use, and, um, and everyone can use those. And it's, it's not an extra that we have to bring out if we you know, notice someone who might, who might need to use them, they're always out, they're always there. And um, I just had a three-year-old the other day who was exploring the use of scissors and was really excited to use all the scissors. <laughs> <laughs> experience for her. Um, another thing I'll just just kind of wanted to mention is facilitation. Um, another thing we try to do is make sure our facilitators understand that they can be flexible with our programming. Um, we have a tinkering space, which we're doing a lot with um, taking apart electronics and seeing how they work in mechanics. And again, I had a three-year-old that she got to explore that by how we put the batteries in to make it work. And she was having great successful experience that way. So that's it, thank you. That was perfect. So we really think a lot too that how legible our programs are, that people can just walk up and understand what it is and how to 
how to do it, then even if they don't speak the same language as the facilitator or you know, language isn't their best way of getting information, they can figure out a way into the program. So we think about all of that and try to design programs that can be as inclusive as possible. So you mentioned the well, okay. Yes. Could you tell about that? So I don't know that much about Lepitech, so other than that uh, I know they design um, toys that would work with for children. <laughs> children. Yeah, so I mean, I so I my they help us with some training so that the you know, haven't actually used any of their materials because we our materials within our museum tend to be um, pretty specialized and pretty unique to us. Well, my experience with Lepitech is parents we got to go to sessions with them and they would suggest toys for our kids and you can check out toys from Lego Tech but just great expertise about what different kids would be able to do, would find engaging, would be safe for them to use. So they're just in terms of looking for expertise to draw and for supplies Lego Tech. Awesome. And what is the name of the company again? Lego Tech L E K O T K. I wonder if this is one that anybody else in the audience has other things to add to about program design and supply spaces. If we really get into the meat of a program, uh, what are some things that, that you keep in mind to make sure that your programs are inclusive? <coughs> the things you're using, the activities you're designing, or anyone else on the panel too? We do a lot of mix of uh, with our kids written, written words and pictures and and then just like trying to make things as visual as you can, uh, because some some people will read and some people won't, and some like I mean, a lot of people love pictures. She can like she can read, but she needs if you show her a picture of a fairy, you know, like she gets that movement much quicker than me saying fairy to her, you know. So visual, I think just visual stuff is as as much as you can have visual aids is so so helpful, and then keeping. Colors. Um, we'll do a lot in theater. It's, like it's a helpful design traffic to have, you know, these two are a couple, so he's wearing a green hat, she's wearing like a green skirt or something like that. You can kind of see how things pair together. So trying to put things so that just with you looking at them, you can tell something matches or something goes. It's helpful to keep things as, as visually involved as you can. I would just add a couple more things about the design of the space that you guys do with the theater yeah. program um, because it's, it's got multiple levels of design. So one thing is that it's a place where all these young people get together so it's a social gathering spot and they have their social experiences, their emotional experiences together. But it's also a place where there's a whole bunch of volunteers, young adults who are in the theater scene who are coaching and, and, and mentoring the kids. And so it's also a place where they get to hang out with young adults and they have a social situation with young adults. Also, by the way, the young adults get to know each other, and sometimes that works out very nicely, too. We've had a couple of weddings that have come out. The volunteers. And, um, uh, but also that they, they design the, the, um, the play experience so that they drop the kids in. This is the method that they use. So there's one of the adults who's with each, each character, and they read the line, not very loud, but loud enough to be heard, and then the child gets to repeat that line and act it. And what Katie says is that gives the kids a chance to act out the, the, the meaning of a line rather than having to worry about remembering it. So to me, all of those are like design decisions that make it uh, work, that make it work for the kids. And there's a bunch more to it, but I just want to add that on. We think about when we're putting together programming and adding to the spaces is allowing room, affordances for collaborative learning to occur. If you don't have a chair out for their grown up, are you really expecting them to stoop for the next 20 minutes next to their child? Or is there a way for them to sit down comfortably next to their child and be at the same um, eye level as their child as they're working together? So chairs are just critical. Cool. It seems like such a small thing. We have to remind facilitators, don't forget to bring up chairs for the guests, um, especially for, for grown ups, because one of the things you'll see in our museums is if you don't have a chair for grown up near the program, grown up will be sitting somewhere else. They're looking for a place to sit down. So, yeah, so if you want them to be there and if you want collaborative learning to occur and for that support their job learning, a simple thing like that can make a huge difference. Yeah, or the experience will be really short. Okay, <laughs> we've, we've been here for one minute and now the parent is ready to go and the child is engrossed in the activity. So we've experienced the same exact thing. And 
And I look at that too as um, removing barriers. So you're removing that barrier of uncomfortableness, like I'm uncomfortable standing here and you're providing a chair, or you're removing the barrier, as you said before, with scissors, that you have a variety of scissors so that there's multiple ways, again, for that experience to happen. So um, just kind of getting rid of all those things, heights of tables and activities, and um, making sure that everybody knows that there are multiple ways to participate. I think, too, if you're looking at a program that is perhaps like a lasting there, so we some for the course and things, it's helpful to have a sense of um, routine. You know, something that, what happens within your hour and a half might vary slightly, but we always start and we end in the exact same way. So it's very clear, like, class is starting because dance party is starting. <laughs> class is ending because we have a we stand or circle and we do a blessing together, like we have a little like, group handshake kind of deal that we do. Like, so I mean, there's room for variations within that, but a sense of comfortability then develops so that they, they know what they're getting into, right? And then they're confident in what that experience is going to be. Those expectations are already set out, so they're, they can see it a little easier because they're not so scared about, you know, what's going to happen next. We know, we know what's going to happen next because it's always kind of routine for eight. Don't be afraid to do the same thing more than once, right? You don't have to reinvent yourself every single time you post a program. If it works, it works. It's great. Do it again. We keep hinting about this next one, so we can start talking a little bit more directly about both facilitation and also staff training kind of falls into that as well. And I think you guys have already mentioned a lot of great resources, even in terms of the external training partners, whether it's other organizations or either um, even like consultants or companies that you hire and to uh, do training for your folks. Um, but yeah, overall, what, what should we keep in mind? Um, that we should help our facilitators be able to do, be confident in doing. And this was mentioned a bit earlier too, in terms of sometimes you can plan ahead and sometimes you can't. So I feel like this can, I don't know, we can go a lot of different directions with this. So I wanted to know what you guys think we should start with. Well, we ask our facilitators to be self funded We have a cadre of facilitators, maybe 30 facilitators, there's quite a bit of changeover. Um, and realizing that people are at different levels at any given time, we um, have a tool called Staff Profile Tool that really lists out some of the various skills that we've been talking about in terms of adapting programs or be, being um, able to communicate in various ways, um, having certain understandings. And then they rate themselves, um, and we hope that, I mean, we really encourage them to rate themselves. Honestly, it gives us a very good idea of what kinds of training the group needs in general, it also really puts the responsibility for professional growth on the facilitator uh, because people change into different rates and their needs to come from within them. Um, we developed it in, um, through a grant that we had from the Institute of Museum and Library Services and we work with Boston Children's Museum. Um, we've already revised it ourselves, we're happy to share it and let you revise it yourselves um, because it, you know, it, it changes over time and what skill sets need to be on that list. I think the most important thing that comes out of it is that change is you know, change for any facilitator. We do a lot of training, but at a certain point, they just need to take charge of themselves and think about where they are in terms of their own personal growth and where they want to be. Um, and then we try to provide whatever support we can. Um, I want to add that that um, facilitating that so so what Katie's group has done is that you guys have how many volunteers from the beginning? <laughs> There's a lot, a lot of wonderful people yeah. who come to, to learn how to do this process with, with Katie Mallory. And um, that when you're, when you're uh, training or educating facilitators to do good work with people with special needs, you're, you, that's a, a level of the education that you're doing too. It's another level of the, of the education. And it creates a resource like those people who now have an affinity for working with people with Down syndrome or people with autism or have figured out, like, unlocked part of the puzzle. Um, they're a resource for whoever's around them for the rest of their life. So it's just a huge part of the work, learning how to facilitate um, with kids. I feel like everyone that's been part of the ABLE drama group, they now are like a gift for anyone with Down syndrome that they meet for the rest of their life. They'll be like, 
what's up with you? I want to get inside your head and figure out who you are, and they know how to do that. So just a plug for uh, just a plug. <laughs> do good work with your facility. But I think, oh, yes. Yeah, I think uh, to uh, just to piggyback on with the staff and taking responsibility, the facilitators. Yeah, I'm a facilitator, but the organization gives so much support. Of course, I would. That's why I'm here today. But we have our panelists up there, you know, from our organization. But I think part this is important to me because. As a facilitator, I want to make sure that I'm giving, with outreach is what I do, I want to outreach to everyone. In my family, some children with learning disabilities, with autism, that's important to me. Um, just like you would if, you, if it was someone with cancer or something like that. You kind of see it in the same uh, uh, focus or vision. Uh, but it is very important that the organization supports the staff so they will be encouraged to go out and uh, you know, foster those things to really reach out and uh, get into different programs like this. Uh, also with CCS, we have uh, uh, teaching facility programs that can also help with different areas uh, to help your programs. But it is important just to reach out there and really get into the community and uh, you know, make yourself uh, able to facilitate. Any, any, sorry. Oh. Yeah, so it, it is hugely important and institutionally at the zoo, um, because of this, you know, beginning and, and what we've done, it's a part of everybody's training at the zoo. Anybody who comes into the zoo, volunteer, staff member, as a seasonal staff member or a full-time staff member, goes through a customer service training. And because we've had these great partnerships, we've realized Everybody needs to know about how to welcome people with disabilities and all people. So a huge um, component of that. There's a video that we include from the West Suburban Chamber of Commerce, and then also another resource that uh, we've shown for a lot of uh, people in our trainings. Um, it's a, a video you can actually find it right online if you Google "I'm Tyler" and it's I'mTyler.org. Is a great video to uh, engage staff and get them talking about how they can support all people when they come to your organizations and programs. I think you're kind of touching on the idea of um, keeping, making sure that you're fostering a sense of community for your facilitators, because especially if you're working with, you know, if you're in a position where you're meeting a lot of different kids, or if you know it, if you know you see the same kids every single week, they can bounce a lot of ideas off of your fellow facilitators. You know what you you need to have that time to talk and say like I tried this, it is not working. What have you done? What can you do? And that's where you know, Josh and Anna and I said before it's interesting that in our program right now our teachers are mostly couples. I know my partner Lawrence, we've got Kendra and Peter, who are husband and wife, and Kendra brought her sister in to volunteer with us. Um, Eva and Zach are, are married. Like, there's an inherent need to have a partner in this kind of work and somebody that you can speak to because it is, I mean, I was, I guess, you know, these kids are my family, like, you know, it gets emotionally investing in a very different way, and you need to have support for yourself. As well, so anything that's going to help to build that community, we do. We do two dinners a semester with our facilitators to make sure that it's like everybody come. We want it. It's on the program so I can take you guys out to dinner and sit and talk and be social. Um, and then we do another training and bring you through to touch in and make sure everybody knows, like, can kind of touch and see what's happening and, and see how we all feel and if anybody has ideas to share. Um, and I try to. I send a weekly email to everybody to make sure that. We're all kind of on the same page and just saying there needs to be a lot of communication and trying to keep it as a community. You know, that you are working together towards this towards the same goal. I think we have a question or comment from Gabby. Yeah, um Gal back there, she kind of moved the logical society. She turned herself about saying that the organizational support is key. Right. And um, one thing that is kind of the out of the box but can get your organization on board is if you do a staff training on this, uh, facilitators, interpreters, docents, whatever you want to call them, it can help with your risk management audit and you know, get a reduction in your actual insurance. 
So if you want to get the heads on board, there's a lot of talks. So what we do, we do three, every three years, and we get you know a check in our audit that keeps our insurance costs down. So kind of different language for different folks, but all to a good cause. Um, another resource I'd love to share is um, it's it's I'm from the Forest Preserve, so it's uh, nature based, but it's called Access Nature, and um, uh, the National Wildlife Federation put together, and it's all those classic activities that you know you see in every nature center, or even if you're a park district and you do day camps, um, the zoo is definitely appropriate. Check where Amy goes around for um, you know the level of life, you know the um, the red rover with the different habitats. But you can apply them to an adaptive to rivers, but it is so good. They've adapted those specifically to both cognitive and physical disabilities, and it's ready on. Um, it's just like, you know, it's like one of those book like curriculums that you pull out, and it has a great intro and a great resource section that's applicable to anybody in this room. So I just wanted to put those two things in. Could you repeat that again, the name of that? Access Nature by the National Wildlife, uh, Wildlife Federation. Great. Best 30 bucks I'll spend. <laughs> Um, we found that it's nice to combine having outside experts come, but also letting um, facilitate <coughs> peer experts, peer mentors for each other. And many of the best ideas are actually within the context of particular programs and exhibits, and that giving them a chance to share. We've been, we've been very happy with the level of sharing, the level of discourse um, as people ask each other and give each other support. Very nice, and also kind of builds a community of learners. You have to have a certain level of training in addition to that. Right? I also like what Mark said earlier about parents. Um, parents are facilitators that are there. You know, they grow you a caregiver with a young person with a disability, often with an adult with a disability. And so, designing ways to get them engaged on the spot is a great thing to do. And then we learn too, so we learn something that we can take away from that experience. So I'm going to jump to my last little bucket category here and talk about the last week impact um, or next steps or connecting to um, home or school or community, kind of making, kind of going back to the big picture again, I suppose. Um, so I'm wondering how we can help to make these experiences impactful in the long term. And we're talking about so many different types. So when I first kind of wrote that question, it seemed simple. But some of these experiences are pretty short, and some are long and then weeks or even years. But I guess, yeah, just uh, how can we make our programs impactful um, knowing that we have a wide variety of types of programs here in the audience? We have to create, um, we say, and this was kind of into facilitator training also, back to that, um, I think it's important to respect process over product. We're doing a, we're doing a play, we're doing a play, we're doing a play for the public, but it's not, that's not really about that. It's about the steps that you're taking to get up to something. So um, just trying to, I think if you keep it kind of focused on that, maybe it'll make it a little less pressureful for you as well, you know, where you can have a little more fun in it. You're not focused on some big deadline or some, you know, some big image of what you have, but really just respecting the process and listening to your participants, listening to the families that are coming in, letting stuff change, you know, having a plan and then and then changing with it. Um, I think that that's the way to make it impactful so that it's actually, you know, evolving in the direction it needs to go. It will evolve the way it needs to if you let it, if you listen to it. Sometimes we just see children for a few minutes, but if we can start a conversation that the parent continues on after they leave, we feel like that's where the, the, the real impact happens. So they, they can move with, and that's why one another of many reasons why it's so important to get the character involved because then they can help keep that conversation going, the vocabulary with things that have happened, we can help the child make connections to subsequent experiences and connections to prior experiences. And that's really where the impact happens. If you work in a museum, you know sometimes it's the actual interaction that you have with the visitor is very brief. Or in the art studio, maybe an hour. But even an hour is very brief. It's not like the kind of ongoing, uh, ongoing connection that you have. But it's part
part of a much bigger picture. It doesn't start at music, it doesn't end. Right? It's yeah, and I think um, those parents are the allies to report back. And you hear if you, have, if you have a program that's lasting for four or six sessions, um, the parent will come back and say, oh, we sang the song the whole way home, all week, and now we're back. <laughs>
uh, we have been fortunate because we work with Ray Graham School and, and Ray Graham Group, and they bring the higher functioning people to our performances during the week. And we're part of the ABA 25 Legacy Project, and we're going to spend a year studying how to do autism friendly performances on weekends. And I guess. I've been observing Chicago Children's Theater's autism-friendly performances, and they're very, I've learned an awful lot from that. Um, what? Red Pig is amazing. Yeah, they're just amazing. And uh, and I see what needs to be done, but they are a small venue, and I know that they're doing it on Broadway, and we're getting advice from them, as well as they've done The Lion King and Mary Poppins, and they're going to do Aladdin. All of that. So there are things that I know physically need to be changed or kind of toned down for kids with disabilities. And it's not like we don't have anybody with autism coming because a couple of years ago we were doing a show and a kid climbed up on stage because he wanted to be a part of it. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about insurance. <laughs> but we managed to get it back in the audience. It was, it was very delicious now that I remember it. Uh, so I guess. Um, I've gotten some really great advice today about who might partner with us, and I certainly am aware of who the disability community is, but I'm just wondering uh, what advice you might have, because we don't have, we, we do have a place where we can have a quiet room mm -hmm. in the lower lobby of our theater, but it's down a whole bunch of stairs, yeah. and you know, there's, there's so many seats on the main floor, and, and so I think I can make the production work, but I need to make the audience area work more. So I'm, I'm curious to know what you might suggest. Um, I mean, autism is not <coughs> my, my personal area of expertise, but I will say my experience with most people with autism is that they, they need an anchor, um, something visible that can help anchor them. So anything that you can include in your program that would maybe there's a moment of like, hey, wave your flag in the air, or you know, hey, you got you know, you got a balloon or something that goes with it. So something that they have something tactile that they can fidget with and have and, and hold on to and take back with them would be massively helpful. I do think a quiet room is also very helpful. Um, and I know with the quiet room that they just did with Red Kite's last project, they just like I think they have a bunch of bubbles, they just call them the bubbles. Go back to the show when you're ready. <laughs> and maybe you just want to stay in the bubbles in that school. Um, but yeah, no, I, think, I think something that could be something that is there that can connect them to the world of the show still, but have, you know, that they can have in their seat with them would be helpful. I know that's going to add so much to your budget. <laughs> no, I don't think that's a problem. Yeah, it's a really good advice. Yes. Yeah. And it's not like the children without disabilities don't need to quiet them. Oh my god, of course, yeah. No. We have a lot of parents bringing their kids out. I would love a fire room. Sometimes. <laughs> you never know.
you're there and I'm here. And it's more fun as a performer, too. Those are always the best shows to be in, where you get to break the fourth wall a little bit. Other questions? I think he has answered all the questions. Okay. Oh, 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 restorative and quiet and you can experience it in many ways with your family or whatever, but it makes me realize how little I know I don't serve people enough, you know, with different special needs and how we can facilitate a better experience. Uh, our children are starting to be very busy and very overstimulating and so we're looking at it like a lot of our trails are more quiet and restorative. So it just makes me any thoughts from any of the nature people or your experiences with these types of people in a family group or a bigger group and how they interact with nature, I'd love to hear it. I'm sure there are a few recommendations that you can provide, but I would say, um, well, I'm a nature person too, that's what I'm going to do. Chicago Botanic Garden has the Mueller and Evelyn Garden, which I think is really awesome. They have a staff member at Ocean Green. Um, I invited her to come here, she's going to make it. But um, she's dedicated to the enabling garden, and um, you might want to reach out to her to see if you can tour her space because she has a background in horticulture therapy, um, and it's it's all about being very hands-on and interactive with plants and with nature. Um, so that's very targeted and very specific, but it is just I, I was inspired by their space and by her programs, and she works a lot with youth and actually all ages. I think she says like from the cradle to the whatever, I'm not like, all, all ages. So she's under? Yeah, she works a lot with seniors, and their space is very well designed. Um, they also do a cool program, too. So, yeah, I've recommend that. Okay. Thank you. Echo the same thing. Um, the first thought I had was um, a sensory garden, or a sensory experience. You have the factories as well as the tactile. If you just Google that, you'll find a good on resources on that. And that's good for any audience, you know? So, um, so that's, again, going back to universal design, that's, that can benefit everybody. So that's a fun thing to do. You can get a volunteer or a Eagle Scout project, perfect. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that was the first thought, but then there's the standards about width and grade that you can look up the real dry nuts and bolts stuff. Um, that's uh, the Smithsonian Institute has excellent guidelines. On that. So again, if you just Google the Smithsonian Institute's ADA guidelines, you'll, you're there. You're there. They'll think they have the most recent, because um, it's ever changing, you know, what the standards are. So everything from how high a waist height is to the angle of it to, you know, again, the grade and the width and the, subs the textures of the trail. So I can give you my card. Too. I was going to say something too. <laughs> um, something else I was thinking of just where you're saying the children. Children's trail can be really busy. If you're not able to actually, you know, pay to have a program, or you don't have the funds or resources or time to put something special together, just even listing that information on your website. Where are the busier places? Mm -hmm. And having, I mean, this is something we always hammer home at CCAC programs. Do you have an accessibility page on your website? First of all, second of all, is there a contact person? And then making sure beyond listing the wheelchair accessibility, which is usually what you find on these types of pages. Listing stuff like this is a busier spot, this is something we would recommend if you're looking for a quieter location, or making a PDF of a social story or something to help prepare people for the visit and incorporating some of the visual um, techniques that we talked about earlier. So, I would add that if you guys create specialized experiences for people with special needs, um, that that be prepared to create something that didn't already exist before. And it might not just be about redoing something that somebody else knows how to do already. And like what these guys have done with the drama, the parents had no idea. We had no idea that what it would be like. And I think we did, we kind of show by show, it's always a new experience and they're all different. And we don't know what the kids can do. We don't know what it's gonna feel like when the kids are doing it. So I just really wanna I encourage you guys to try something out that maybe it hasn't been done before. What happens when you get a large group of kids with autism or blind kids in the same place doing a creative process and then 
publicize it to the world, put it out there so that other people can learn from it. Just we love that you guys are interested in this and we would love to see it happen. Thank you. With that, I'll actually um, just give a huge thank you to our panelists. And I'm going to ask everyone to join me, giving them a big round of applause. Fade to Black, white text on black background. Inclusive programming for children with disabilities. Presented by Chicago Cultural Accessibility Consortium. For workshop resources and more information, visit chicagoculturalaccess.org. Presenting speakers, Jacqueline Peterson, Shedd Aquarium. Sivia Cohen, Chicago Children's Museum. Mark Friedland, Brookfield Zoo. And Josh Radinsky and Katie Yo, Chicago Children's Theater and ABLE Ensemble. Workshop accessibility. Kathy Raycan, Real-Time Captioning. Video Editing, Captioning, and Audio Description by BridgetMelton.com Video Fades to Black